welcome back to the Film Brain Podcast. And on this episode, we're talking about another specific film. We're talking about Fighting With My Family, the new film produced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And who better to talk about a wrestling movie than people who are actually wrestlers? I mean, that makes total sense, right? So all my guests tonight are all wrestlers and we're going to be talking about this movie from the perspective of people in the industry which i think is going to be really interesting first up you'll know him from rocked his youtube channel luke spencer hello everyone Second up, Rosenthorn. Hi there, how you doing? And finally, I think this is a bit of a coup for me, Simon Grimm. Hi everybody, hello. Thank you for being here, everyone. You're welcome, thank you for having us. I mean, I think yeah, we're all- happy to be here. It's really cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you uh, actually said yes to this, Simon, because I, I do have to admit, I was kind of like, well, he might, but he might not. Well, he might, but he might not. <laughs> I had actually sworn off interviews last year because they were getting very repetitive. It was always the same sort of 10 questions. Yeah. And at a certain point, I was just getting bored answering them over and over again. So I just was like, I'm done. I'm not doing any podcasts, any interviews, anything. Then I got the offer to do this. And I was like, I actually like Film Brain. I watch his reviews on the YouTube. And I was like, I should just say yes. That, that's one that's going to be fun. Film Brain, you need to put that on your business card as a quote of endorsement. <laughs> I actually like Film Brain. <laughs> Simon Grimm. <laughs> I definitely do. Just when they think I'm out, they pull me back in. <laughs> Ironically enough, that is something very wrestling to deal with, is that you can... I mean, Terry Funk is on, what, his 48th or 49th uh, retirement match? Oh, yes. <laughs> He's going for 50. 50 this year, yes. There we go. <laughs> no wrestler is retired until they're dead. There was actually a, a case a few years ago of a luchador in Mexico who legitimately died at, like, 78. He had bookings on a schedule still. He died with bookings. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> he was in demand. It was that simple. But that's very much a wrestling thing. Coming out of retirement for it does make sense. Good. <laughs> In case you don't know, Fighting With My Family is a biopic about Soraya Knight, better known as WWE's Paige, who is played in the film by Florence Pugh, and how she came from a wrestling family, the Knights, who in Norwich, England, run a local wrestling federation called WAW. And she, along with her brother Zach, played by Jack Loden, auditioned to be in the WWE. And unfortunately, what happens is that he ends up getting passed and she ends up getting accepted and the film covers both of their stories and their journeys but more focuses upon Paige and it's based upon this original documentary that aired on Channel 4 in 2012 called The Wrestlers Fighting With My Family. Apparently the story behind this movie is that Dwayne The Rock Johnson was filming Fast and Furious 6 in London and apparently he was watching Channel 4 in the wee hours of the night, stumbled upon this documentary and thought, ooh, this would be a fantastic story to make a movie out of. And lo and behold, he has produced this, directed by his Tooth Fairy co-star, Stephen Merchant. <laughs> what a fantastic movie Tooth Fairy was, incidentally. Brilliant, excellent, just wonderful. On the list of bad rock movies, it is actually very high in quality compared to something like, say, Doom or... Yeah, uh... Doom was the rock bottom, so... no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> you can't help but involve rock bottom puns when it comes to that. That was my one, and I'm done. Yeah. There we go. I liked this movie quite a bit. It's fairly formulaic in terms of being a sports movie and kind of being an underdog story, but I thought it was fine for what it was. I mean, it doesn't really break a lot of ground, except for maybe for the fact that it's actually set in wrestling, which I don't think is a world that we actually see on screen a lot, and I think we'll probably discuss that later. It kind of lost something in the middle of the movie, I felt, but it picked back up towards the end. But I did overall generally think it was quite quite funny. I actually thought that, that Merchant did a really good job of replicating the dynamics from the documentary. I don't know how the rest of you all felt about it. I will start by saying I actually have yet to see the film. I have seen the documentary. I put a lot of faith in Steve Merchant because obviously uh, if you've seen any of the other work he's done, extras, Life's Too Short, any of the stuff he's done with Ricky Gervais or even his own stuff, mm. even Logan obviously, he did a great job in that. Yep. He has a great sense of comedic timing and drama oddly enough because again there's that strange connection between drama and comedy you often see. I guess my fear about it, and I don't know if you could put this to rest was Nick Frost obviously is yeah. I, I'm sure does an amazing job but my concern was that the best actors in the movie were going to be the people that are in it the least mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if I'm correct in this assumption I mean Nick Frost made Cuban Fury work, and that was a movie that should have not been enjoyable at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think what the stumbling block for me would still, as I said before we were recording, is having been there at the same time as Paige in NXT and knowing how inaccurate a lot of this stuff is going to wind up being. Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Coming from someone for me, I'll just add on to that. I'm the reverse of Simon, where I have not seen the documentary, but I have seen Fighting with My Family. Mm. I enjoyed it for the most part, for what it was. I thought it was an entertaining film. My interactions with Paige were very brief. This was in where her hiatus, um, before she returned back to WWE, it was back in 2017 when I actually met her briefly. Mm. And that's the limits of how I know Paige personally, and that's just a very quick thing. So I'm completely out of the loop on that sense. But as a fan of the film, I enjoyed it fine. And also for WWE Studios, this is a big step up. Oh, yes. I can't really explain this more than saying WWE Studios has a bit of a stigma to them, mm. if I could put that politely. Yes. I think it's stigma is a nice way of saying it. <laughs> yes. I, I was trying to be so polite and like tread carefully on that because to put it more crudely, there's been a lot of garbage pumped out of the WWE Studios. Are you saying that you're not a fan of the Marine Six? I was not a fan of 12 Round 17. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I will say that at least 12 rounds three or was it 12 rounds reloaded the one with Dean Ambrose I think it was two was, no that was no because two is Randy Orton oh yeah you're right you're right Randy Orton was supposed to be in the Marine part two and then he got cut because he actually was discharged dishonorably from the Marine Corps <laughs> yeah <laughs> big debacle yep and they put the Miz yeah because the Miz has never served but not serving is better than a dishonorable discharge apparently especially for going AWOL yeah yeah a lot of the WWE studio films it, it follows a similar formula to Happy Madison oof kind of yeah but it's where you invest kind of like 10 million dollars 20 million million dollars in a movie that's going to turn around and make 50 million it's not going to be a huge success as far as winning awards but it has built an audience that will come back and see it and it'll just be you know double your money that you invested yes that's a good way to put it okay yeah, fair enough again for a wwe studio film for it to be actually enjoyable is again a huge step up yeah that's top notch if you can yeah. get a wwe studio f and have people leaving happy in droves from theaters too not as straight to dvd that's a big deal oh yes i thought it was okay i didn't love it but i also didn't despise it i just I had the least wrestling experience in general. I'm still, you know, training for the most part. But I feel like they tried their best to be accurate but fair. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I know they got wrong. I think some of it they deliberately fudged. And again, we'll kind of get into that. I think a good starting point is to talk about the documentary because I watched that earlier. Watching the documentary after watching the film is a really interesting experience just to see how much Stephen Merchant took from the documentary because I was watching an interview with him earlier and as he explains he's not really a wrestling fan so when you think about it, he's a director who's coming into it very cold very much from a casual point of view so he's sort of learning about wrestling as he's researching the movie he was directly passed on the documentary by Johnson as he says you kind of fall in love with the Knight family over the course of that documentary you know they're rough around the edges but they're really endearing in a lot of their ways and it's replicated a lot in the film especially in terms of the dark Dialogue? Like um, the dinner table scene where Nick Frost's father, he's talking at the dinner table and he says, oh, I spent time for armed robbery, mostly violence. <laughs> and that's that's something he says directly to camera in the documentary. The early scene where at Page is handing out leaflets promoting the WAW show is inspired by a scene in the documentary where she's walking around handing out leaflets to people on the street. There's a lot of scenes that are taken directly from the documentary, which I think helps ground the movie in a sense of relative authenticity and I think that's generally the feeling that I got from this movie is that generally speaking it gets a lot of the facts right generally okay when it comes to like her relationship with her family I, I see that's probably the easiest stuff to replicate because again if it's actually on film in the documentary mm. it's very easy to go and look and pull from it directly where you're going to run into trouble is I know that you said they uh, it covers her brother Zach was the one who was doing the tryout with her mm. I don't know if it ever goes into I think it's her older brother Rory. Roy? Yeah, they talk about him. Yeah, Roy. Uh, the, do they bring up the whole thing about why he can't come to the US anymore? Uh, yeah, they do. Because he was in jail, yeah. Okay, I was because I, was, I didn't even know if they covered that, because like, he was actually booked over here for a while uh, in CCW as the Zebra, I'm sorry, the Zebra Kid. I'll give you the proper British pronunciation of it. Ooh, fancy. Ooh. Yeah, uh, so I'll, yeah, I'll go there. <laughs> but it was one of those things where he disappeared, and I remember when I was actually talking to some people about it, they're like, yeah, he's not allowed to the US because the Knight family in Norwich was so insistent on protecting the business, as they, they would say, mm. that he would get into fights all the time and winds up doing time over it. So it's kind of this like sad footnote that his career got handicapped by his desire to try and protect his own career. It's briefly covered in the film. They don't focus on Roy as much because he's 
spends most of the film in prison. Yeah. So they mention that he's in prison because he'd um, thrown some concrete at someone in a fight. It was a fight, yeah. It was just like a fight scene. So he doesn't really appear properly in the film until probably about two thirds of the way through and he's not really much of a character in it. He's there, he's mentioned in passing, but he's not really a pivotal focus of the film. And it's sort of similar to the documentary in that way in that he's mentioned, they show him in the original documentary, but he's not really the focus of that documentary in the same way the other family members are. Fair enough. What I did find interesting about the way the film sort of elaborates in certain respects with regards to the documentary is that you don't really get to see, obviously, because WWE and NXT and all that is very secretive about their process. What I did find interesting when watching the documentary is that you don't actually see a lot of that in it because they obviously can't film and get permission to go there. Is it a permission thing? Well, part of the issue is it'd be a blatant inaccuracy right off the bat. Yeah. When Paige started with WWE, FCW, Florida Championship Wrestling, was still the developmental territory. Yeah. I know uh, Vince Vaughn's character, I don't know what his name is, he looks very similar to the guy who would have done the hiring at the time named Ty Bailey. Uh, his character in the film is Hutch Morgan. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask if this character was actually based on someone. Well, it seems like he's an amalgamation of two guys. Mm -hmm. The one who actually hired her, which is a guy named Ty Bailey, and the guy can't, who currently does the job, and I'm not joking, this is his real name, and it is 100% worse than Hutch Morgan, whatever that was, uh, uh, which is Canyon Seaman. Yep. That guy. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh, man. Oh, no, no. He'll, he'll tell you straight up. He's like, I heard every joke you can think of by the time I was 12. He's like, there's not one you can hit me with that I haven't already heard. <laughs> Good for him. It toughened him up. But things like that where obviously they're going to have her going to the PC and going to NXT because from a marketing standpoint, WWE building name brand value yes. in a property they don't use anymore would be silly. Also, the training, again, when she started there, it was being run by Dr. Tom Pritchard, who had a very different training style than Bill DeMott, who took over while she was there and in turn by uh, Matt Bloom who currently runs it. It would be kind of disingenuous to recreate any of that because they don't really know what was going on. I hate to say it that way but particularly when Pritchard was there they had no idea what was going on in the training schools. Yeah it was definitely the part of the film that feels like it's most fictionalized in a lot of ways where they took a lot of liberties but you could understand why they did that in a way that they were trying to also streamline it at the same time and it felt very rushed but at the same time they kind of had to do that like almost like microscopically focused on one person in the training training center when that's like very rushed in that sense too. Yeah. And I'm not even 100% sure on the timeline in the movie obviously but does it cover her going to Japan or the US at all? Uh no. No. Not Japan. No. It only covers her going to America. She did a couple tours in Japan right before she got signed. Huh. And she also I know she did some stuff for uh, Shine which is a major women's independent promotion in the US. Yeah. Because she was actually over there Becky Lynch at the time who was still recovering from a back injury was her manager. She did some stuff with her mom in the US. I, there's stuff like that which I feel like they're not going to touch on at all. Mm. Which I guess apparently they didn't, if you guys are... If this yeah, is this no, there was nothing about Japan. Yeah. The WWE, like, the first time she's ever been to America. That's a complete lie. <laughs> yes, that's... Yeah, exactly. Fresh off the boat into the NXT studio. Oh, uh, yes. She's very much presented as being quite green in a lot of respects. And again, I think that does kind of a disservice to her as a person, because wrestling is very much a... Particularly in the case of her family, very much still a carnival-type industry. Mm. So to sell her as this naive child who doesn't know about the world around her it's like the one thing she knew how to do was survive in the wrestling industry because she's been doing it since she was basically a fetus which isn't a metaphor um this is a fun story if you want to be horrified oh no <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so uh, her mother sweet soraya was not aware she was pregnant right away uh -oh. and worked some matches and Robbie Brookside who's currently a trainer at NXT who's been a long-standing British legend he actually was one of the last generation of guys to work on World of Sport originally mm. uh, he knocked her he hit her slammed or whatever uh, Soraya while she was pregnant with Paige while she was like just pregnant eh. huh. so uh, Paige will joke that she, you know, Robbie gave her her first bump when she was still in the womb <laughs> <laughs> her first set of drills were in the womb nice but it's it's that sort of thing where it's like they, they're not really going to go into that stuff yeah they try to animate it <laughs> I think when I described her as being green, I think that may be oversimplifying it, but I think in some respects they present her as being inexperienced, especially in terms of sort of ring presence. I think that's more the sort of crux of the film. In the prologue of the film, they establish that she's been wrestling since she was 13, and they smash cut to her in sort of the present day of the movie. Yeah. Paige's real arc over the course of the film is not in terms of learning how to be a wrestler in the sort of technical sense, but more as a performer in terms of building on her own self-confidence and her own persona 
persona. Which is fascinating because her mom actually makes a point in the documentary about marketing her and showing how to market her and like, you know, she's a good looking girl, which means it's a little bit easier and she's laying when she's laying out all the photos and stuff. So it, it's odd to me because again, they're presenting it as the, which goes back to sort of the revisionist nature of WWE having a hand in the script, I'm sure. Mm. When guys get signed to WWE now, they almost all go to, to NXT, to the Performance Center in Orlando, Florida. Yes, that's what the film represents. One of the big myths that they tell people is, you know, we got to break these guys of their indie bad habits. Yeah. My favorite question to ask when people say that is, well, what are indie bad habits? And what indie bad habits do a guy like Finn Balor, who was world traveled, had wrestled in Japan for a decade, was a top name literally everywhere he'd been, or Shinsuke Nakamura, who again, a top name in Japan, Sienna Lamas, who was a top name in Mexico, worked in Japan. What do these guys need to learn that is so special that they don't already know? And the truth is nothing, but it's a marketing ploy. If you say, hey, I'm going to spend, you know, $200,000 bringing this guy to the US, they need to justify the cost. Mm -hmm. And they justify it by saying, you know, oh, well, we're training him. We're teaching him the right way, but it's all marketing. As someone who was in there, I can tell you they would hire guys who are world travel professionals and pretend like they were teaching them how to wrestle and then go, see, look what we taught them. <laughs> <laughs> so I highly doubt Paige was nearly as insecure as they're presenting her as a performer, just because, again, it seems like that also plays into the whole, because I mean, The Rock inserts himself as a character in the movie, correct? Yes, that is correct. It's sort of a small cameo. Yes, as The Rock, yeah. Which, to my knowledge, is complete fiction. It is fiction. They've said it as much. So again, it's like even the whole idea of her asking him for advice on how to have charisma, <laughs> which is a silly question because charisma, as most people can tell you, it's either inherently something you have or something you don't. It's just a matter of how well you express it. You look at most stand-up comedians and the difference between good ones and bad ones are ones that are charismatic or at least know how to exploit the charisma they have. Stephen Wright didn't exactly have traditional charisma, but he knew how to work with what he did by keeping the monotone, whereas there are other guys who might have a monotone voice and, you know, they try to talk like The Rock, they wind up sounding silly. Yeah. See, now I just want to see an alternate universe where Mitch Hedberg teamed with Chuck Taylor. You see, that would I pay to see. <laughs> Chuck Taylor still has, this is a complete sidebar, and I'm sorry for hijacking this, the best promo video ever released. Really? I, I think it was for IWA Mid-South, but it shows, it's he's trying to do like the whole training montage, but he does it as ridiculously as possible, where it's like, you know, 5 a.m., shows the alarm clock going off, hits the alarm clock. <laughs> like, 12.17, alarm goes off again, he gets up out of bed, <laughs> takes two steps, gets into a wheelchair, rolls himself <laughs> to the living room, gets up, goes into the kitchen, grabs a bowl of cereal, gets back in the wheelchair, rolls himself back in the living room, and starts eating cereal in the wheelchair, falls asleep again. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. This is just the video. This is him training, preparing for a match. This is great. Okay. That's genius. But that's an example of a guy who knows how to work with what he does. Like, mm. He's not a physically impressive guy. So if he goes out there and shows himself, you know, doing the Shawn Michaels prepping for the Iron Man match, it looks silly. Yeah. But if he shows himself like, no, I'm so lazy that this is how I prepare and I'm still going to win, <laughs> it plays into his personality. And the same thing with uh, Paige. I think she understood better who she was. If anything, I think the company didn't really understand her because their, her first t-shirt said, guess again. Or I'm sorry, I said think again. Think sorry, again. That's, that's yeah, what it was. yeah, yeah. This is something she'd never said, to the best <laughs> of my knowledge. This wasn't a promo. She even did a promo one time making fun of the shirt, where she just kept saying think again over and over again. That was her only response to anything. <laughs> and then she'd try and like, do a sexy butt wiggle at this person, and they'd be like, what are you, what are you doing? She'd go, think again, think again. <laughs> <laughs> but it plays into the whole idea that if WWE is using this film in part as a marketing tool, mm. they want it to seem like she really needed to be there and they showed her how to do it right. That's not 100% true. Yeah. I think it kind of serves two purposes in that it works as part of the fact that the movie is in general sort of this WWE promotional vehicle, but also it works as a sort of simplified storytelling conceit. I think that's what Merchant found so fascinating when he was researching it was the fact that it was not strictly about technicality, it was more about performance as well. And, you know, that kind of plays into the whole WWE going into the whole sports entertainment thing. You know, they don't call themselves wrestling. It's the performance center. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a big part of it now, too. Which, ironically enough, even then is a marketing ploy. Mm. Yeah. If you really break it down, what WWE does with the whole concept of sports entertainment, it's similar to how if I asked you what that small cardboard and cotton device used to clean one's ears is, what would you call it? Q-tip. Yep. What is it actually called? Cotton swab. Cotton swab. Cotton Uber. Brand recognition. Yeah. This is what WWE likes because if you say pro wrestling, you can mean anything from New Japan to AAA to uh, World of Sport. But if you say sports entertainment, people know you're specifically talking about WWE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, they try and present the performance aspect of it. Uh, it was one of my favorite, shall we say, cognitive disconnects that I've ever heard. Triple H is talking about a match. He's like, guys, it's about storytelling. <laughs> you know, Rocky's the greatest movie of all time, and it's better than any boxing fight you'll ever see. People watch Rocky a million times over. People might watch a boxing match once. The match he was talking about was Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, the match with 37 power bombs and 15 dives and 85 
brain busters. <laughs> so just to clarify, that match is about storytelling where they're doing all the moves known to man. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Well, you mentioned Rocky, and I think that Rocky is a good thing to mention because I would actually argue that this, of course, borrows that template in that you have this hero that comes from this sort of rundown background, and in the film, it's very interesting to see in what I would assume is a very big Hollywood promoted film, but is in general a very kind of British movie, so you have a lot of scenes actually filmed in Norwich, set on the council estates, and seeing that kind of world, and then contrasting that with having someone plucked out of it, and then being thrust into this totally different world in the same way that Rocky gets picked out to fight Apollo, and I think that in the same way the film echoes that same structure, so I think that there is a very deliberate attempt at the WWE to try and make their own Rocky to tell that kind of story. Well, and again, it's Rocky is the prototypical sports story as we see it now. You don't really see a whole lot of movies that stray from that formula. John Avelson and Sylvester Stallone kind of perfected it mm. with the first Rocky. Weird to think about now that Rocky was depicted in the first movie as being over the hill already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's supposed to be in his early 30s, like 31 or 32, and he's already way past his prime and he's never going to get these big fights because he's too old. Mm. And then he would go on to fight. So Rocky Balboa, <laughs> si like Rocky Six. Yeah, yeah. where, where he, uh. he fought all the way up to part six. Even then they make a joke about it in, in uh, Rocky Balboa when he, he says nothing's over and Mason Dixon says, is that from the 80s? He goes, that's actually probably the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Even he's kind of conceding that it's been 30 years since the first Rocky movie, but I think maybe that's where you're going to find the easiest way to tell the story, though, is that if you don't stick to that, and she has a certain degree of the real-life Rocky stuff with her, and yeah. that it did have that from rags to riches type tale, but there's also a lot more on the tail end, which I think we'll get into later, that is kind of left off from where the movie ends. Yes. You mentioned about sort of the NXT training and how they try and get rid of indie bad habits. This actually brings up one of the things that I actually found quite interesting is that there is actually a sequence where they specifically call out the practice of receipts. The concept is that, of course, that someone botches their move and impacts you stiff them right back, essentially. Yeah, the, traditionally, the idea of it is oddly enough to prevent animosity from building up. Mm. So what happens a lot of time is because wrestling, while we are trying to perform and put on a match without injuring each other, a lot of the physicality has a degree of realism to it because there's no real way to fake it otherwise. I was limping this week because uh, my instep was uh, pretty well banged up just from throwing too many kicks. Mm. I was wrestling a guy who was almost 400 pounds, a guy by the name of Ace Romero. Oh, I love Ace Romero. I, well, I'm throwing roundhouse kicks to his chest, and at a certain point, it's like, well, I can only hit him so light without it being very obvious I'm trying not to hit him hard. Yeah. So I have to kick him to a certain extent. I'm trying to kick him as safely as possible, but I'm still kicking him. And that's putting strain on my ankle and my uh, in my instep where I'm, I'm connecting with the kick. Yeah. But uh, the idea with the receipt is that rather than it building up animosity because you stiffed me, you hit me for real, I'm just going to hit you back for real one time right away, and then we're done. Which, even then, when you're saying, well, they're trying to break her that habit, is kind of funny because I guarantee you no wrestler ever gets broken into that habit. <laughs> nope. The only time you don't receipt someone is if you're absolutely sure they will take it personally and can't hurt you. Oh yeah, they specifically call out that purpose in the film that yeah. Hutch actually stops them fighting and says, you don't do that. You apologize right now. He He's very firm about it. I can only assume that's a bit of a liberty. Paige slapped the woman after getting elbowed in the face twice. Yeah, that's actually perfectly reasonable. A, a friend of mine, Lindsay Snow, just had one where a girl, I think, powerbombed her on her head and she got up and just cracked the girl with a couple kicks and put her in a uh, legit heel hook to, to just kind of like reaffirm that she could yeah. mess her up if she wanted to. But that's, I wouldn't even say that's unreasonable. Unless you're in there with Brock Lesnar who can actually hurt you, no one's going to stop you for that. Yeah. They're, they're actually, they're probably going to question why you didn't receive him back if it happens. That seemed like something that was taken from real life, but didn't necessarily felt like it rang true in that respect. That felt like a fairly common thing in the world of wrestling, even in WWE. <laughs> Honestly, that would be the more likely question is why didn't you just hit him back? You look weak if you don't at the same time in the back too. That's how I was always taught the same way. There's a guy, he's a wrestler out of Washington, D.C. And I only bring him up by name because randomly Mojo Raleigh had actually knew him. Okay. But it's a guy named John Kerman. Hmm. He did a uh, training camp that I was at once. And we did just a little five-minute match or whatever, and I did legitimately catch him in the face with a kick. I wasn't trying to, but I just caught him in the forehead with a roundhouse kick. Hmm. It was the same thing. He woke up like someone had just tased him. His eyes got real wide, and he went to shoot a double leg on me. And I knew I'd fucked up. I knew I'd I sniffed him. <laughs> But I also knew I'm not going to let him hurt me because he's mad. As he went to double leg me, I sprawled and face locked him. I literally just put my head right next to his ear and I said, calm down, calm down, calm down. I just kept saying it as calmly as I could <laughs> until he stopped thrashing because he was like trying to get at me. And then there was, I could feel that exhale of like, 
okay, I'm not going to get you. <laughs> good, good. Happy ending. But that's the reality of it is I was in a position where I knew that I could defend myself and not hurt him, but you're not always in that position. And again, he got stiffed and he felt he had to hurt me. I was like, I knew I stiffed him and I, I felt bad about it when I did it. And it wasn't going to be a second one. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to push this farther than I have to. The idea that you would tell someone not to receipt somebody is kind of silly because that's, yeah, that's not even a close to anything that would happen in reality in wrestling. Right. Yeah, I mean, it goes into how a lot of the stuff with the sort of NXT training is where I think that the movie, I think, loses some of its credibility for me a little bit. The Hutch Morgan character, who I'm surprised how much I liked Vince Vaughn in this movie. I think I'm just surprised when I like Vince Vaughn in anything, but <laughs> I didn't mind him in this movie, but he's mostly there as sort of the tough love kind of teacher. Which, again, the actual guys in developmental, they have next to no contact with you. Uh. Oh, he's very hands-on and prominent in this movie all the way through. And yeah. Yeah. I legitimately can tell you is that unless it's a TV day or a tryout day, you don't see the TR guys just because they have real jobs. Yeah. They're corporate guys. They do office stuff. Canyon, who was there when I was there, he would have to travel to China, India, Brazil, just anywhere there were athletes that wanted scouted. It was part of his job to go look at them and see if he felt they had potential to be worthwhile signing, which was kind of a pointless thing to do because they basically did it off credentials. Yeah. They would send him down there to look at them and ask them if they were interested. But I think it was the uh, Arnold in 2015, maybe? The Arnold Classic, which is a big bodybuilding festival they do in America, they actually had the guy who plays the mountain on Game of Thrones, uh, mm. well, Half Thor, I think his name is, which is weird. His name is literally Half Thor, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess is just a Nordic thing. You have names like that. He was invited backstage when we did an NXT show at the Arnold, and they were courting him and trying to get him to sign, and he basically was like, I can make 10 times as much money doing nothing. Why would I sign? So that was yeah. that was his logic. They're not there every day. They, they have actual coaches and like, and guys who run the PC, the, the TR guys, the people who do the hiring, they're not the ones that are there doing that. The Hutch character, he gets revealed as being a bit more sentimental towards the final scenes of the film, where they kind of reveal a bit more about him, and especially that he's buddies with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. There's a scene where he's telling a story about someone who was on the road. He, he wasn't quite ready for the big time, so he threw himself into everything. It turns out he's actually talking about himself, so he says, oh, I threw myself on a 30-foot cage, and you go, so is he kind of meant to be Mick Foley? <laughs> this is where, like I said, as a wrestler, why watching movies like this is very hard for me mm. because I would immediately go, well, that's Foley's story, not his. And even then, Foley's the first one to admit it wasn't a 30-foot high cage. It was actually like 17 feet, which is still really high. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But wrestling is the world of uh, hyperbole. Wrestling and pornography. If it's 10 feet, it's actually 25 feet. If it's 25 feet, it's 100 <laughs> feet. Again, porn is the only other industry where it's like, if it's a 10-inch penis, it's actually a 25-inch penis because apparently those numbers aren't impressive enough. We have to double them by one and a half in order for people to really be impressed. 25 inch. Oh my god. See, what got me was he says that The Rock threw him off the cage, and I'm just thinking Rikishi was the guy who got thrown off the cage by The Rock. Yeah. Vince Vaughn is supposed to be Rikishi. You know what? <laughs> that movie I would like. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I've done shows with Rikishi, and I, I can safely say he is super gangster. You don't even realize Smoans are gangster as all hell, and it is amazing. <laughs> so the idea of Vince Vaughn playing a gangster as Samoan would be the greatest thing ever. Uh, and doing the stink face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other weird thing is in that scene with The Rock, he calls him by the nickname Sex Tape, which he explains is, oh, he makes other guys famous. And you go, that's a good, that, what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> It caught me off guard. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, his logic is he calls him sex tape because it makes other guys famous. But again, Hutch would be the one to have made anyone famous. I got thrown off a cage. Well, I think more people remember Foley taking the bump than remember Taker throwing him. Yep. Taker's remembered for other things, but like when you think about the cage, you think about Foley going through it, Foley going off it. You don't even necessarily think about Taker. Though the best thing from that match, again, hijacking this because that's what I do. <laughs> if you watch, I don't remember if it's the pay-per-view cut or the VHS cut. When they're in the ring after Foley goes through the top of the cage, Terry Foley gets right in Undertaker's face and yells stretch and does a big hand gesture basically telling him Foley needs time and that's when Taker he uh, chokeslams Terry Funk out of his of shoes. shoes yeah they put that on the DVD cut now you can even hear him on camera like, he yells it he is not subtle at all <laughs> yeah reading the story about that match is quite entertaining I think Doyoui did a sort of retrospective article about this and I think Foley was actually unconscious on a stretch of a part of that match which is just like which what we know about head trauma yeah, now yeah. is horrific there's so much information 
information out there now about head trauma that we didn't have. Like even when I started wrestling, I started wrestling in 2001. And I remember, you know, it's like you'd get a concussion and people would be like, oh, okay, just wait a second. Okay, get back in the ring. Right. And that was in a school where a guy had died from mm. post-concussion syndrome. Yeah, that should tell you something about what wrestling could be like. So yeah, the idea that he's supposed to be Mick Foley or Rikishi is just really weird. It's again one of those elements where they play to people who know about this stuff because they know that there is going to be an inbuilt audience that will know about this story, will know all the details about it, but they're also trying to play with people who don't know anything about it. And I think that was one of Merchant's reasons why he did this movie is that he didn't actually know about this story, even though it's a homegrown story and yet a lot of people don't really know about it. And I think uh, in the UK, because we have World of Sport Wrestling and things like that, we tend to think more traditionally of wrestling as, you know, giant haystacks and all that, <laughs> you know, which is nothing like the sort of WWE brand or really any Federation's brand these days. Even when they brought back World of Sport fairly recently, it was more sort of pound stretcher WWE more than anything. It's the weird thing that was said about the rebirth of World of Sport was that it didn't seem like it was trying to be its own product anymore. Because the original World of Sport is fascinating. One of my favorite finishes of all time came from World of Sport. It was uh, Johnny Saint and Jim Brakes. Saint goes for a leapfrog and rather than doing the thing that pro wrestlers do, which would be run underneath, Brakes stands straight up and basically runs forward, hits Johnny Saint in the nuts with his face, and they call the match a a no contest due to unintentional contact with the groin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which, I hate leapfrogs. I will yell about a leapfrog in a match if I see one, because I think they're the stupidest <laughs> thing in pro wrestling. For just that reason, why would I duck? Why wouldn't I just run forward and push you out of the air? <laughs> For all the leeway I'll give anyone on anything in a match, you can do a moonsault into a Canadian destroyer and I won't bat an eye. But when you do a leapfrog, I just go, why wouldn't I just double axe handle and knock you out of the air like the Hulk? <laughs> like, there's no reason. I have no motivation to duck underneath you or not catch you or throw you or any one of a million things. But that's the thing is that World of Sport had a very different look to the way, even the way the guys wrestled was very different aesthetically from the way guys in WWE. Again, Brookside, who I was fairly close with my time in NXT, he talked about when WWF guys in the early 90s, mid 90s would come over to England Mm. and they were doing punch, kick, stomp, hit your finish. And that was completely foreign to the the audiences over there. They'd never seen that until they started seeing WWF television. It just wasn't how wrestling was done in England. I mean, it really wasn't. I mean, it's strange even to me because obviously I grew up later. I think I'm more familiar with the WWF and WWE brand because that was what I grew up with when I was sort of interested in that sort of field. The sort of world of sport aspect of it feels very alien to me. I was going to say foreign, but that would be weird because I'm British. <laughs> you know? <laughs> nice. True. I think that dichotomy is still kind of represented in the film because, of course, you've got WAW also represented in the film and, you know, it's presented in the movie as being this very small-time operation. It's sort of helping out people in the community. There's a little tiny subplot of Zack training a blind wrestler, which is actually based on real life, apparently, and uh, I thought that that was a fairly interesting element. And they try and work that in there. They try and work in the idea of, okay, it's people from these tough backgrounds. They could potentially go into more violent criminal activity and yet wrestling provides them an outlet and I think that resonates with what's in the documentary in that the Knights wrestling is their religion they find their salvation through it essentially that's actually not an uncommon thing to see in wrestling either because you have people who by all accounts just because of their mental or personal skills essentially they're modern day pirates there's a lot of guys if you describe their behavior in any other field it seems insane even in the entertainment industry pro wrestling does provide an outlet for this because it's just normal behavior at a time when racism was rampant in the United States, not to say it isn't now, but in the 1960s in Memphis, Tennessee, one of the biggest advocates for uh, integration was a guy named Sputnik Monroe. Mm. He was a white man. He was a United States Marine Corps veteran, fought on the beaches of Normandy, and he was a professional wrestler, and he was a heel, no less. And he made a very big deal when they did not want to let, because he'd hang out on Beale Street, which is predominantly black. Mm. (laughs) He made a very big deal about when they wouldn't let his friends in to watch him wrestle. There's another documentary that was done called uh, Memphis Heat, where he says there's one point in Memphis Tennessee where you went into black household there were three pictures you saw up Jesus Christ Martin Luther King and Sputnik Monroe because he was that beloved by the African American community yeah and he's dead serious that's awesome that's a guy who in any other field might just get arrested he actually did get arrested on several occasions because again segregation was so heavy heavily enforced in the south at that time Mm. he got arrested for being in a black bar on Beale Street and he went before the judge and said your honor I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran I fought for this country on the beach of Normandy you're going to tell me who I can and can't drink with the judge said he's going to fine him $50 Sputnik slapped fifty dollars on the judge's uh, bench, <laughs> walked out, went right down to Beale Street, back into a bar, got arrested again. <laughs> awesome, that's so great. But that's what wrestlers do. They're naturally mentally unstable people, and it's, it's a historical thing. Even just a fun aside, if you're not familiar with him, Bo Dallas Taylor Rotundo is actually the son of IRS Erwin R. Scheister, Captain Mike Rotundo, whatever you want to call him. So he's been around wrestling since he was a child. His uh, grandfather, 
was one of the Blackjacks. His uh, uncle is uh, Kendall Wyndham. So when Bo was, I think, eight years old, his dad brought him on the road. He was wearing these little metal tip cowboy boots. His dad goes to introduce him to The Undertaker, who Bo was absolutely afraid of, just scared of, because, I mean, he's, he's a kid. And Taker goes to shake his hand and like, introduce himself, and Bo kicks him in the shin as hard as he can and runs away. <laughs> Oof. Ooh, dear. So now we're going to flash forward about a decade. Bo is, you know, standout amateur wrestler, football star, and his dad gets him and a bunch of his friends tickets, brings him backstage at a show, and they're all out at ringside sort of before the show. And Taker's in the ring working out. And, you know, he looks over and he just yells at him, hey, you Captain Mike's kid? And Bo's beaming with pride. Yes, sir, I am. Takers pulls up his sweatpants to reveal a little V-shaped scar on his shin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Brutal. Points at it and goes, you little fucker that gave me this. <laughs> <laughs> and white as a ghost no sir I am not that was not me nope not me that was my brother <laughs> yeah pretty much that's the way he went with it but again the idea that at 8 years old he tried to kneecap the undertaker no sane person does this it's an industry where they bring in the dregs of society the criminals the madmen at a time when being gay was basically a death sentence in the US again you know you had guys who were openly gay in wrestling even if they weren't openly gay in the rest of the world and people just knew about it and it wasn't a thing mm. because we're all there to work with each other and make money we are all that we are the singing dancing shit of the world so to speak that no one would take in anywhere else so we have to take care of each other which is a, a weirdly endearing thing about the industry that doesn't have a whole lot that's endearing about it to be quite honest that's a lot of what the movie tries to capture in a lot of ways is that it's a lot about sort of family not just in terms of the night family represented in the film but also just in terms of sort of the locker room and interacting with each other and having to work with each other you know they, they describe it in the film as fixed not fake so the blows land and it is painful it's sort of like choreography it's like a dance I think they make that reference a couple of times through the movie they do it's sort of rough but it's got a real heart to it underneath that layer and I think that's what resonates and, and that's probably the best they're going to be able to hope for because again you can only be so honest in any biopic mm. so the best thing you can hope for is to be able to make an emotional connection with the audience and at least be able to have a metaphor about a small part of their life that might not be as true but is more it, it's the, actually you know it's a Jebediah Springfield thing. Sometimes a pretty lie is better than a uh, ugly truth if you can relate to the pretty lie. It's a wrestling movie, but there isn't a lot of wrestling wrestling in it. I think that's again trying to make the movie more universal. So it has a lot of detail in it. But I think as Merchant said in an interview that I watched, he tried to make it broadly appealing, but have the right kind of detail because audiences know what's real and what's not. And they kind of like the sort of nitty gritty aspect of that. And I think in some ways it is kind of universal in some respects that sort of underdog story it's why those kind of tales keep connecting with audiences time and time again even though we've seen countless variations of them we know what the beats of them generally are but you were saying about a pretty lie that actually brings up as part of Paige's arc she has a bit of a hostile-ish relationship with some of the other divas that are brought in to train alongside her because they don't have the same kind of wrestling background that she does they often are models and so on so forth and so they're really learning the ropes for the first time and she has a kind of snobbish attitude towards them but she also feels like an outsider she feels like a freak which is quoted to her several times in that she's not conventional in the same way that they are but it's actually her attitude that needs to change over the course of the movie but before that point she actually dyes her hair and tries to become one of them and I thought that was interesting even though I'm almost certain that can't be true As as far as I know, it's not. Like I was saying earlier about the whole her being a stranger in a strange land and being unsure of the world around her. I don't think they're giving her nearly as much credit as she has. Knowing people who were around her when she first got there, she was well aware of the marketing and uh, what she was doing. She might not have necessarily fit into the aesthetic that was traditionally seen for women in WWE because it's it's long been said, if you look at the, the women going back to, say, the mid-90s, 95, 96, with women like Tammy Stitch, Sonny, Sable, it was a lot of the, uh, you know, large-breasted, blonde hair, blue eyes, non-athletic just sort of skinny type women that was what they were marketing yeah because they're just marketing them as TNA <laughs> um, not total non-stop action the other one so, the other one so um, that was seen that she didn't really fall into that category but having talked to people who were there and having seen firsthand she was well aware as like sexuality is part of what you're selling it is part of the image and she knows that as a woman that is something that's expected of her in that job there is one case oddly enough where that did happen where someone was kind of unaware of that one of the stories was that when Bailey who's another one of the women in in, uh, NXT, who she's on the main roster now, when she first got to FCW, they made her wear a mask because they said she was not pretty enough. Ooh. Yeah. 
one of the production guys actually got with some of the other girls and just said, look, can you guys show her how to do makeup or something? Because they were contemplating firing her. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Which is weird to think about as popular as she was in NXT. And she's now, you know, one half of the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. And they were literally contemplating firing her because they thought, and it's like, you know what she looks like when you sign her. It's not like you were unaware, but she was very much a an athlete. She was a, what you would call a tomboy traditionally. She didn't wear a lot of makeup. She didn't overly girly girl her manner of dress. And she was a wrestler. She was someone who trained to wrestle. And that was why she was signed. Putting that on page, though, again, it's similar to the uh, giving the Mick Foley stories to Hutch. It makes for a better story because you don't want to hear about the story about the guy who was really talented and worked really hard and then was successful and enjoyed his success and everything was fine. Yeah. You want there to be struggles and challenges and setbacks. The traditional, you know, what is it, the third act breakup yep. that you see in a lot of uh, rom-coms? Yeah. And that's represented here. There's a sequence where Paige kind of, she goes back to Norwich to visit her family and she considers calling it quits. There is literally that beat in this movie. Which, again, it, I just, I shake my head because I question if that's ever been a thing. I mean, everyone admittedly, at some point or another in their time in NXT, in developmental, does contemplate quitting. Mm. Usually it's more out of frustration because you're banging your head against the wall doing what they tell you to do and they're not doing anything with it. She was fairly well worked in from the time she started working on FCW TV and actually right up to the first TakeOver special she was working every single show. She was on every single TV taping. She was the first NXT Women's Champion as well. Not in this movie. Not in this movie, no. Yep. That brings up some other stuff. So it does try to incorporate elements of the women's revolution that Paige very much helped usher into the WWE but it also downplays certain elements of it because it has to simplify the story and one of the big things I think for most wrestling fans is that it just glances over the NXT stuff for the most part it's mostly just training fights it's not really represented as being a division of its own really in that sort of respect so you don't really get to see a climb to the women's title so the movie has this kind of weirdness in its arc where essentially Paige is catapulted to appearing on Raw without really the sort of audience impact that her appearance would have had in reality and that seems more insulting to the product than anything else to be perfectly honest the, the idea of debuting someone putting the most prestigious title for their division on them right away with no explanation or justification it's been done before don't get me wrong but this isn't Kane this isn't you know a monster they've built up in promos and vignettes for weeks and months and who's already got a storyline where he's connected to guys like the Undertaker and Steve Austin and Mankind this is someone who unless you follow British wrestling you wouldn't have heard of before so the idea that they would do that with her is again it, it seems like they're trying to make it more of an accomplishment and simultaneously that makes it seem like less of an accomplishment. It's very strange in the movie. I mean the whole final aspect of the film kind of struck me as a bit weird in a lot of respects because the final fight scene with AJ Lee, the movie kind of mentions how everything is fixed beforehand. They know what the outcomes are going to be and yet the way that this fight is represented at the ending of the movie it's almost like they're pretending that it's actually real. Like Paige didn't know that the tie was going to be on the line that she was going to win it it's, a, it's kind of just weirdly framed I know that having a climax to your movie where the hero knows the outcome is a bit of a weird thing to really tackle but it just struck me as odd that was my biggest problem with the movie even though I did enjoy the movie that ending was the biggest problem how they kind of showed the ins and outs of the business to a certain extent all throughout most of the movie but then it kind of juts to the page's debut on Monday Night Raw right night after Wrestlemania everything's real yeah everything's in the heat of the moment. This wrestler that you have a POV experience with, this is really happening and everything is 100% non-fiction and it just, it really has a tonal difference. That's long standing been the issue with whenever you try to tell a story with pro wrestling. It probably speaks to why it's done so rarely or at least done so poorly when it is done. It's hard to tell a story where, as you said, the protagonist knows the outcome of their match before it starts. But that doesn't make it any less daunting because something that can happen and not very often does is that if something falls flat, it falls flat, no matter how good it might be in theory. When Paige and Emma did their match at NXT, the, the very first NXT arrival, or I guess it was the only NXT arrival, it was the very first takeover event technically, but it was the first live special NXT did, they literally wrestled each other every night for about three or four months leading up to that. Every NXT house show, and I was there, and goddamn if I didn't have to see that match a thousand times. <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they wrestled each other every time, and they were in the PC working on that match with the coaches, with Sarah Amato, with Norman Smiley, because the match couldn't be bad. Mm. For the sake of selling the women's revolution, which wasn't even a thing yet, but for selling them as serious competitors on a live special that was airing on the WWE Network, they could not go out there and have a bad match. So they had to make sure it was going to be good, which is way more daunting a task to 
me than a real fight. Because a real fight, you're either going to win or lose. Yeah. But a fake fight is either going to be good or bad. And that's way worse because whether or not it's good or bad is viewed as being in your power. And if it's in your power, then it being bad means you did something wrong. And that is way less forgivable than a loss. A real fight can be ugly, too. It can be brutal, short, quick, instant, and just grotesque. That doesn't work the same way in sports entertainment. The way the film tries to work around it, I think, is that it tries to make the culmination of Iraq less about the actual outcome of the match, so much as being the culmination of her finally stepping into her known persona. When she gets into the ring, she's daunted by the enormous crowd, and she goes dry on the microphone. And it's only afterwards, after she's won the title, does Paige finally step into the persona that the audience know her as, and she says her catchphrase. I thought that was interesting, but I'm not sure it completely absolves the issue of the climax of the movie. There's also a few little things, like people don't pick their own names in WWE, as far as I know. They don't cut their own promos on the fly, even in training. And this is just a minor thing to me, but they got AJ's costume completely wrong, and it's the easiest thing to do. Yeah, I, that one actually bothered me too. I will say, during training, they will let you cut promos by, it is your own hand, but that's part of the problem is what they teach you in the Performance Center is not what you need to know. It's one of my big explanations I have to give whenever I do a seminar or anything like that is, the two things you need to know how to do when you go to WWE when you're on the main roster is read a script and perform it, which you never do in the PC. At the PC, you're 99.9% .9 of the time, I think I was given one piece of written dialogue the entire time I was there, and it was written by another one of the talent. Wow. And that was a very specific exercise we were doing. We had to write promos for other people, but it was come up with something and then basically just go out there and perform it. But then you get to TV and it's, okay, here's three paragraphs. You have to memorize these word for word, especially the ones highlighted in yellow, because that means Vince wrote that line. So if you get it wrong, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we got that. Oh. The worst was when you saw that yellow over a line that was completely rancid and you knew was bad, but you also knew that's the one line you have to say. You could argue to change anything else in the script, but that's the one line you can't change. And that's when you go, okay, I'm probably screwed. I just have to do this. It's a skill you should have, but at the same time, it's one they don't really take advantage of on the main roster. In the same way with picking the name, you have some say in it, but they ultimately approve or disapprove. There's also a copyright thing or trademark thing. If they can't trademark the name, which happened with Liv Morgan, she was on TV and NXT very briefly under the name Marley, and then they got a cease and desist from Bob Marley's uh, state. state. State, thank you. Because technically they couldn't use the name Marley. Ooh. Mm. So there's a lot of stuff like that that goes on. Oh, but the other thing you have to learn in WWE that they can't teach you in the Performance Center is uh, how to work with their camera setup because they have like a 12 camera shoot, which is very different than anything you're going to do anywhere else. Even, even in NXT, they don't have 12 cameras. I think they only have four. So you're all of a sudden working for a bunch of different cameras you didn't know were there. Yeah. A lot of the details with stuff like the gear, it seems minor, but again, it's like the 1990 Royal Rumble being used as footage for Glow, which was set in 1985. Mm. It might not really affect the story, but from the standpoint of a viewer who knows the details, it upsets me. There is a couple of weird instances of this all throughout Fighting With My Family, right from the very outset, actually, because the first thing you hear in the movie is The Rock's current day theme tune, which is set to footage of, uh, I think, a 2001 King of the Ring? Or it's 2001 or 2002, but it's, generally speaking, that was not The Rock's theme song at the time. And I also thought it was quite funny that The Rock produced this movie, and of course, <laughs> the first thing you hear is The Rock's theme song. Well, again, The, the Rock gotta get his, which, <laughs> that's... Hey, it's his movie, he can do what he wants. Yeah. It does have the least necessary epilogue text I've ever seen, where it says <laughs> Dwayne Johnson continue to have a successful movie career, or something like that. I go, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> he is technically the biggest movie star in the world right now, but that doesn't stop me from wanting Vin Diesel to have his own expanded universe unto himself without The Rock, but that's just me. I... <laughs> that was Triple X. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I want an expanded Viniverse <laughs> where Triple X coexists alongside Dom Toretto Riddick. and Riddick and the Pacifier. <laughs> is this Chronicles um, universe or is this like Pacifier and everything else universe? Is it all meshed together? All. Okay. I want Groot and the Iron Giant fighting alongside each other. <laughs> <laughs> with the various other Vin Diesels. I just want a movie where it's literally Vin Diesel CG'd in with 30 other Vin Diesels. All the Vin. It's like Avengers Infinity War, except it's all the Vin Diesel's characters fighting off Thanos. Exactly. Okay. But Thanos will in fact be Vin Diesel as a bad guy from whatever movie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Maybe it's the guy from Find Me Guilty. I don't know. Whatever movie he was in as a bad guy, Vin Diesel is fighting Vin Diesel. Because who else could challenge an army of Vin Diesels but Vin Diesel? But Vin Diesel himself. Yes. Exactly. The Rock doesn't have that. Not yet. Get on it, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the final fight at Raw, I think Paige said in the interview, yes, I know, that's not the costume that I wore when I actually did that. And I go, well, I can kind of understand that because, again, it's tying into the fact that, okay, we're going on this journey to 
Paige as we know her as a persona, so she's going to have her proper costume that she went on to have, not the purple outfits that she actually wore in that fight, and so on and so forth. But, you know, there's lots of little things like that all through the movie. And they don't affect the overarching story. In the same way that when you condense a story down, it doesn't necessarily take away from the whole point. It's the downside of adapting anyone's life story, as we talked about earlier, is that you're always going to have to cut stuff out, re-edit stuff, make things more brand-friendly for what they're doing right now. Again, with The Rock, you have to make sure it's the current Rock theme song. When it's Paige, you have to make sure it's her current gear. When you're talking about developmental, you can't mention FCW, you have to talk about NXT, because otherwise you're building equity in brands that aren't current. Yes. I mean, this movie is a decent movie, but it is a WWE ad, and it has to be on brand. Pretty much, and that's why they're a billion-dollar company. I mean, let's be real. Yeah, their marketing is second to none in that sense. WWE sold themselves as a dream machine, so to sense. Like, come to WWE, if you work hard enough, your dreams will come true. And that's kind of the mold they were kind of setting up that for, because Paige works so hard. But without the WWE, it wouldn't have gotten that high. Which, again, also speaks to why they would leave out, beyond just streamlining the story, a lot of her earlier successes and her working around Europe, obviously, and yeah. America and Japan. Because if you mention that someone's already successful without WWE, you have to ask the question, well, what did WWE bring to the table? And that's a lot more of a complex answer, so not really easy to fit into a two-hour movie. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that complicates this movie is that I think even when they were shooting this, Paige had the neck injury that retired her. In addition to watching the original documentary, I also watched the video that WWE posted on their YouTube channel recently that documented that where Paige was attempting to make her comeback and then she had that injury in the ring. It's really quite unsettling to watch that. You see just her losing control and she just falls to the ring. It's quite unsettling to watch that footage and apparently she was very close to being paralyzed then. She was very lucky. It was at a house show, correct? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a house show after she'd come back. She'd already done some stuff on TV, but she had a whole lot of matches. Right. Mm. She'd had neck surgery and she was out for a while. She popped a couple times on the wellness policy. Once, I think, for having something in her system and then a second time for... Uh, she said it was, she couldn't actually make it to the test, which is a weird loophole because usually, unless you're out of the country, you should be able to make it to any of those. But like, They give you a window of several hours to make it to the test. Yeah. If you get called with one when you're not on the road. Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And even then, the injury, it does happen. It's not uncommon. There was another case with Tyson Kidd, actually, uh, maybe two years before that. With Joe, yeah. Yeah, with Samoa Joe, where he took a relatively benign move, but it broke his neck. By all accounts, the uh, plates they had to screw into his uh, neck, where it broke, are in the back of his jaw. That's how high up they said it. Basically, if it had been any higher, he would have died. Yikes. It just happens sometimes. There's no way to predict how your body's going to react to something, especially once you've had surgery to correct an injury. I tore both my ACL in 2004, and I've been fortunate that I've never had problems with them since then. But the one thing I remember my doctor telling me, he said, you know, you tore the pair God gave you, sure as hell can tear these. So be careful. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. You have a neck injury. They surgically repair it. You can get hurt again. Yeah. You can absolutely get hurt again. Like, there's nothing stopping that from happening. It's just an unfortunate reality that it did happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, the most famous neck injury is Stone Cold. Which, you want some irony on that one? You want a big old slice of irony pie? Like, Let's hear it. Steve Austin suffered uh, a broken neck from a reverse pile driver or sit-out tombstone, however you want to call it, from Owen Hart. Austin did the exact same spot, not even just the same move, the exact same spot, the uh, cartwheel pickup into the tombstone with Masachono about four years earlier in the, uh, I think it was actually the G1 in New Japan, and he broke Chono's neck the exact same way. <sighs> with the facing the opposite way for yeah. the, oh my gosh, yeah. I had no idea. Like I said, it wasn't even just that he did the same move. It was literally Chono picked him up for it, he rolled, he picked Chono up for it, sits out, and he broke Chono's neck. That's why after, uh, I think it's 93 or 94, you see Chono start to get a lot smaller physically because he couldn't really work out after that. Mm. I hate to say it this way because it's a harsh thing to say about anyone's injury, but Austin kind of should have known better because literally he did exactly that to somebody. Yeah. It's a very unsafe maneuver, but it did happen. And speaking to the sort of weirdness of pro wrestling, a guy has a broken neck and ring and you have someone else standing there yelling at the crowd for several minutes so he can very gingerly fall over to get pinned because we have to get to the finish bro no matter what happens yeah, yeah. we can't not have the finish and if I'm correct that match with Austin and Owen if Austin lost he had to kiss Owen's butt didn't he I remember some stipulation like that about us in the title match I just remember that being a bad hard stipulation too so if that would have happened that way storyline lines would have been worse but still that just everything about that was a disaster as we get farther along and we understand more about the human body and health we realize how monstrous we used to be towards ourselves and each other in pro wrestling same thing with Foley in the cage I don't know who would possibly think that was a good idea in the modern era <laughs> who would let you back in the ring with a concussion like that is yeah. insane. Yeah. No one in football is going to be like, oh, half his leg's hanging off. Yeah, put him back out there. He'll be fine. <laughs> 
Virgin, you want to say something I, I noticed. Yeah, there was a British wrestler named Kid Lycos. He's had three major injuries recently, and most of them have come either on or near his uh, return from the previous injury. Which is sad, because Lycos is good. I've, I've done some shows with him over oh, in England. Yeah. He's really nice, and he's really talented. Him and his partner, uh, Chris, are really super duper awesome. Yeah. yeah, he falls in that category where he's just such a small dude, where unfortunately, he's going to want to be more injury prone because people are just going to sling him around. Mm. It sucks, but it does happen like that, and it's kind of why I think Paige's injury was also so much more shocking because Sasha Banks and her are about the same size. So Sasha throws the kick and Paige goes down and 900 times out of 901, nothing would happen. It would have just been a normal bump and everything would have been fine. So that to see someone about the same size as her hit her and she goes down that hard is very shocking. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I was going to ask is that uh, does knowing that she is now retired, does that cast something of a shadow over the movie? And I would say not completely. What she inspired, especially in terms of the women's revolution in the WWE, she played such an enormous role that I think that even in light of her injury, you can't downplay that she had an enormous significance, even if her career was cut short, unfortunately, by injury. It is something that they don't even mention even in the epilogue of the movie, even though it would have been something that they'd be easily able to include. Well, it falls in the same category as, I think, uh, was it Shooter? No, I'm sorry, American Sniper. Mm. Even to that, they at least allude to what happened to Chris Kyle, but it does, to a certain extent, not necessarily take away from her legacy, but it does sort of, from a storytelling standpoint, make for a real downer ending to throw that part in. Yeah. It's harsh because that is reality, is that you don't always get happy endings. Yeah. No one wants to watch Animal House and see uh, Robert Blutarski uh, is now a senator in Washington, D.C. He died of a drug overdose June 13th, 1983. You know, like, no one wants to see that. Yeah. Oh, you just had this fun, exciting, you know, uplifting movie. By the way, Paige is basically paralyzed. Like, no one wants to read that. In terms of having to deal with those kind of obstacles, I think the film does a fairly good job in handling that. I was going to branch off and talk about the other movies that have dealt with the world of wrestling in general, because there isn't a whole lot of them, and the only other one is more like the total 180 of this movie, which is Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Very different. (laughs) Yeah. Am I the only one that noticed that it seems like Aronofsky's whole MO is picking a subject matter that people are very vaguely familiar with like they just sort of have a basic concept of even if it's inaccurate and then just writing whatever story he wants and making it seem like that's how it is if you look like he's done basically pro wrestling heroin and ballet (laughs) yeah the wrestler I watched and I really wanted to like but there were so many blaring inaccuracies and absurdities I struggled to enjoy it Mm. and I found myself more just wanting it to be over (laughs) what were some of your issues with that movie first and foremost it's a relatively minor one but they present Randy the Ram popularity wise as being on the level of a Hulk Hogan or a Shawn Michaels Mm. but then he's living in a trailer park like Jake Roberts with a drug problem but then he's also still really in good shape which again if you saw Jake Roberts when he was at his uh, shall we say most Jake Roberts 2010-ish yeah he didn't look like he knew anyone named Jim to steal an old cliche (laughs) let alone having been inside one it was stuff like that where you know Hogan even at his most financially destitute so to speak wasn't living in a van in a trailer park in rural New Jersey you know but this is a guy we're supposed to believe had video games and was booked in one of the biggest matches of all time and then there's even the whole thing where the promoter who's like the stereotypical almost cigar chomping leisure suit wearing you know I got two words for you (laughs) rematch yeah in in 20 well actually it'll be 18 years in August in almost 18 years of pro wrestling I have never met anyone like that I have never met a promoter who was that guy it was just very weird because it seemed like Aronofsky had had, like read some random books or uh, things like that and just picked up these characters like the one thing that was genuinely real that I had a, a good laugh at was the uh, the short payday of sorry I thought the house was going to be better because that is a very real thing pro wrestlers have to deal with yeah that and wrestling in middle school gyms which I don't think a lot of people realize that's a very real thing oh yeah but again it was a lot of the details and even this random things like he has a heart attack from getting on the gas again which wouldn't happen that quick this is a weird little bit of medical trivia the way steroids traditionally cause heart attacks and stroke is not actually the chemical compound themselves but it causes a thickening of the blood mm. the reason guys wind up having heart attacks and strokes it actually isn't necessarily the chemical itself that they're putting in their body, but rather the side effect of their blood getting thicker. I know Raven talked about it in some of his interviews that he would literally, while he was on steroids, he would go and get phlebotomized. He'd have a pint of blood drawn. Wow. Because that would naturally cause his blood to thin out. And this is why he's avoided a lot of the health problems that guys would have. It's not as quick as, you know, you do an injection on Monday, the way they show it in the movie, and then like on Friday, you have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Particularly if he wasn't continually on it. Like, that's the other thing. If he was continually on him, that would have been one thing, but they show it like he hadn't been on him for a while, then he just got back on. So that was kind of a weird thing. And then on top of that, 
that, you know, he has the heart attack, and then two nights later he's doing cocaine in a bar. Yeah. Which, again, I'm not an expert on the human body, but if you just had a heart attack, you do a line of cocaine, odds are you are going to die that night. <laughs> You're not going to go bang some random woman with a uh, firefighter fetish, which, again, seemed like a really weird detail to throw in. It was a very odd sequence, and I saw this movie before I started wrestling, and even I was like, what? what? What's wrong with this guy? Yeah, on the list of things I've seen happen in pro wrestling, I can safely say no one has ever come back to me and been like, dude, I hooked up with this girl last night. She had a firefighter fetish. <laughs> Coke in the bathroom bar, man. It was great. No, that I've heard about. But <laughs> <laughs> The weird part was the cocaine wasn't the shocking thing. I was like, oh yeah, no, that, I've seen guys who would do that. But again, a lot of the details in The Wrestler, it was similar to that, where I'm watching it and I'm going, uh, that's not quite right. Uh, I appreciated the gigging. Mm. They made a point about that. The blade, yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff like other than that where, like I said, it was the little details that really bothered me. And it wasn't that it was necessarily a bad movie. I just, I would have liked more from it. There was no contrast. You know, it was like the highest you can hope for in pro wrestling is, hey, the guy who was the uh, the Sultan, what was he, what was he called? Uh, Ernest Miller. Ernest Miller's a character, yeah. The highest you can hope for is running a car dealership, a used car dealership in Arizona. You got guys like The Rock. You got guys who are millionaires independently who've like retired from wrestling. Hell, there's a, uh, was it a uh, Stan Lane or Dennis Condry? One of them like does powerboat racing commentary now. Huh. Not even joking. That is his full-time job. He does commentary for powerboat racing. He does the occasional, you know, uh, fan convention or stuff like that, but that's how he makes a living. And so there are a lot of guys who get out of wrestling and do fine. Mike Rotundo, in addition to doing pro wrestling, he worked in real estate. There's a lot of stuff like that where people don't realize these guys have like actual skills and real jobs. It used to be a running gag actually in NXT because uh, Bill DeMott, if there was like sort of a morose feeling in the group, he'd be like, hey, Walmart's hiring. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he'd leave the room, you start hearing, motherfucker, I got a degree in law from NYU or I've, I did this, I did that. I played in the NFL. I'd look at him and I'd be like, guys, I've been wrestling since I was 18. If I get fired, my ass is going to Walmart and filling out a fucking application because I got nothing else. Like, this is all I got. <laughs> nice. Even then, it's like I didn't have the meteoric rise and run a Randy the Ram is supposed to have. So that was always something that stuck out to me was it seemed like they took a guy like Jake Roberts and fused him with a guy like Hogan. Those two lives don't really line up as far as what they experienced and what happened to them later, you know? Yeah. 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 That does make a lot of sense in terms of the characterization for the Ram. Well, I will say that this movie is a substantial step up for the last time that WWE has actually addressed their own business, which surprisingly they haven't really done in a lot of their films. A lot of them base wrestlers in action films or horror films, but they very rarely involve the wrestling world. I think the last time they did this was Knucklehead with The Big Show, who actually has a cameo in this movie. I think that was the last one, but that was like very few yeah. theater selections though too. I saw Knucklehead, it was not good. <laughs> it was not good. Technically, I think the other one you have to mention, because I think it is a WWE studio film. I might be saying, wasn't WrestleMania one? The one about the wrestling dog? Or was that just a random independent movie I'm thinking? Was that not them? I think it was a random independent. I have never heard of that. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, Jomo. I know I haven't either. It's about a Jack Russell Terrier, the pro wrestles. Huh. Huh. Okay, then. How did this escape my radar? <laughs> now, there's that. There's another one where it's about a, a mom that goes into pro wrestling. There's some weird ones out there. There's some weird wrestling movies that aren't WWE related. Yeah. Uh, oh, God. Uh, that's still more believable than the Jack Russell. <laughs> it is. But at the same time, we are on like, what is it? Like our 37th Air Bud movie, technically. Yeah. Yeah. They're going through all the sports. <laughs> they're in like space now. They're superheroes. They're monsters. I don't know. It's... Air Bud in space? Wow. Space buddies. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the thing. But, but that was actually part of my pitch for the Viniverse was it was going to be Triple X and Fast and the Furious is one movie and then at the very end is when Riddick comes into play and then the next one is in space. <laughs> gotcha. And they use all the different air buds and space buds as their mounts as they ride to war. You know what? Yes. Okay. Screw it. The Viniverse is now including the air bud universe. There we go. That's... I think that's a worthy inclusion. The reason I think WWE shies away from doing movies about wrestling mm. is it's still a very secretive business. Yeah. Which the actual ins and outs of the industry are very hard to talk about without talking about a lot of the uncomfortable things that happen in them, which run the gambit from things like sexual harassment, sexual assault, drug abuse, drug addiction, death, both accidental and by misadventure. I mean, there's a lot of really horrific stories that go on through pro wrestling, and it's hard to sometimes tell a story about pro wrestling without mentioning those stories. Yeah. Even to something like uh, one that a lot of people gets glossed over a lot, I kind of had a laugh over it, even though it's horrible. A couple years ago, there was going to be the fabulous Moolah Classic. It was uh, it wound up becoming the Mae Young Classic, which was an all-women's tournament in NXT. Mm. A big stink got raised over them using the fabulous Moolah's name because there's a lot of information out there about her doing some very unpleasant and frankly criminal things. Literal pimping. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, literal pimping. There's a company run by Al Snow called Collar and Elbow, which is a t-shirt company, and they have a t-shirt that's a takeoff on the old skateboarding isn't a crime t-shirt where it says pro wrestling isn't a crime. When I read that, my first response was like, sure as shit used to be. Because <laughs> wrestling was a criminal act. Like the whole protecting the business phrase wasn't about protecting pro wrestling. It was about protecting the con. Because if people found out that what you were doing wasn't a legitimate contest, the least of your worries was getting arrested. You have things like Pat Patterson is praised for being, you know, the first openly gay pro wrestler now in the modern era. Mm -hmm. But he was never openly gay when, at least in the world, when he was wrestling. And this also leaves out that he was fired from WWE in 1985 for sexually harassing uh, various ring crew guys. Ugh. Yikes. This is like a recognized part of wrestling history. This isn't something that people are unaware of. Again, it's hard to like set a story in the 80s about pro wrestling and not bring up stuff like that happening or all the drugs or all the sheer insanity, the violence. And not just we're talking about the fights. I mean, some of my favorite stories are the fights, but Haku, uh, Ming, notoriously like the toughest guy in wrestling history. There's a bar that's in St. Louis, Missouri, East St. Louis called Pops that's open, I think, 23 hours a day. They close one hour to clean. This is where he supposedly fought like 23 cops. Wow. And I've never heard anyone challenge the legitimacy of the story. That's the weird part. <laughs> like, he's one of those guys where usually when you're like, oh yeah, that, that was where Haku ripped the guy's eye out. They're like, yeah, it is. <laughs> There's no challenge. It's like, no, that happened. Are you going to tell him that didn't happen? I wouldn't. He's pushing 60. He's a lovely and polite man, and I would never say an unkind word or challenge anything he has to say. A friend of mine actually uh, was in the gym with him. My buddy Brandon, he, he used to work for Cellucor. He's a big dude, you know, half Samoan, so he's, he's in there, and, and Haku's just like, hey, brother, can you can you spot me on the bench? Yeah, sure. He doesn't give up that he's a wrestling fan, and he knows who Haku is. He's just like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll spot you. Guy's benching like 400 pounds. Impressive. And he doesn't look at either. He just gets on there. He's like, ah. Uh, uh, racks it. Yeah, my shoulder's bugging me. I could have probably done more. <laughs> <laughs> Going more in-depth with wrestling, you have to talk about it's kind of your business. And for an industry that's really not even just an industry, but for a company like WWE that's tried to sanitize its image so much over the last 10 years, especially, it might not be the best business practice to go, oh, hey, by the way, this is what wrestling used to be like. This is what it kind of is like now. Yeah. You know, maybe this isn't the business you want to be investing money or time into because we basically employ a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> the movie like this is different from even the movies that they were making back in the day. Historically, of course, the first WWE film was No Holds Barred with Hulk Hogan, which very much uh, represents the wrestling world as being exactly what it is in real life. <laughs> and Which almost is the better way to tell the story, because you can't really address wrestling as it really is. You can't really show wrestling as a work, because it's harder to tell a story that way. It's like, I I've had people ask why they don't do that with the video games sometimes. If Fire Pro is an exception, because it actually rates your match on quality, but I've had guys ask, oh, why isn't there a wrestling video game where it's like, you actually sometimes you have to win matches sometimes you have to lose matches sometimes a match has to go longer because the main event isn't there so like you're semi-main you guys have to go at least 15 minutes in your match because the main event has to get out there it's because it's not really fun to play that yeah. it's not really fun to tell those stories fighting with my family would be a very boring film or unpleasant film if it was 100% accurate to Paige's life yes exactly you can't really address wrestling as being real but addressing it as fake is almost more uh, insulting I mean No Holds Barred is kind of a really goofy movie <laughs> it's really fun <laughs> yeah it is but that's why it's so fun with Zeus alone. Yeah, Zeus alone. Oh, the, the mind blower for me. Okay, so where I grew up, we didn't get WCW or NWA. Okay. Or AWA even. We only had WWF where I grew up. The mind blower for me is becoming a big fan of Stan Hansen in Japan and seeing all his work there and then going back and watching No Holds Bar and being, oh my God, he's the teeny wiener guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's the big drunk redneck with the mouth full of chewing tobacco talking about how, what do we got here? Couple of tiny waiters. <laughs> that is one of the most feared men in Japanese wrestling history. Jeez. <laughs> That's the second most mind-blowing thing I had with Stan Hansen. The first was, for years in his promos, he always talked about his big fat wife and his big fat kids back in Texas. I saw his wife and kids at the WWE Hall of Fame. His wife is a very petite, lovely Japanese woman. <laughs> And his sons are three very normal-looking Asian-Americans. If you asked them what their dad did for a living and they told their dad was Stan Hansen, you wouldn't believe them. Like, it's one of those. The only other wrestling movie that comes to mind is, of course, the notorious Ready to Rumble, starring David Arquette, the WCW champion in all of our hearts. That was an advertisement for WCW. That was 100% just Ted Turner trying to get more attention for that. And if I may say so, you want to know what the weirdest thing about that movie is? And this, I'm going out on a limb here. That is probably the most accurate wrestling movie ever made. <laughs> totally. As weird as it might sound, not necessarily the stuff on the ending, 
thing with the whole like real fight. Yeah, but but the idea of like the way they're talking in ring and the way Jimmy King is this egotistical asshole. Like, it's weirdly honest. It's kind of like if you watch Funny People, the uh, Adam Sandler movie. Yeah, how it's weirdly like self-referential about Sandler's actual career, the movies he makes. You're almost like, wait, does he know he's making bad movies, and does he kind of feel bad about how bad these movies are? Yeah, that's always the question with me when watching that movie. Is like, how can he be that self-aware and then make all the stuff afterwards? <laughs> It's a weird reality, and it's this. This kind of stems off into something completely unrelated. I saw someone talking about the new Ricky Gervais show on Netflix. One of the comments they made was that he flirted with the idea of the importance of artistic integrity in extras, and that wasn't what I took away from extras, which I actually really enjoyed. Him and Stephen Merchant, I thought, were great in that. The thing I took away from extras wasn't so much about the importance of artistic integrity, but rather the realities of trying to balance artistic integrity with success. There are cases where you might have someone who's a very funny comedian or a very good actor or a very good pro wrestler and they're put in a situation where they're told, well, you can do this or you can fuck off. There's no mid-ground. It's you either do what we're asking you to do because that's what we hired you to do mm -hmm. and that's what we were sold on or you can leave and you can try and do what you want to do but you're going to have to figure out a way to make it work because we're not going to help you. Which, again, is kind of the point of extras is at the end of the day, it's like, well, I have a show. I'm making a living but I'm not doing the show I want to do. I'm not enjoying it but my option is do this or go back to being an extra or worse yet, go back to working in an office which I hated so much I quit to try and pursue acting. And it's a weird trap to be in and as someone who's actually technically been in that trap, I can tell you it's not a fun choice to make to be like, I want to walk away from this. Mm, yeah. I want to walk away from my guaranteed six-figure job to try and make this work outside of the system because it's not easy. And Ready to Rumble, again, has that weird sort of understanding of Jimmy King isn't necessarily a good person. You know, you're not supposed to just like him. It's like they kind of have to show his redemption because he's filed for bankruptcy a ton of times. He's got a drinking problem. He's kind of crazy. He has drug issues. <laughs> they even address the fact that he's not a good wrestler, which is a weird thing to admit in a movie that you have this guy who's supposed to be the biggest name in pro wrestling and he's a shitty wrestler. Yeah. And then the idea that he actually has to learn how to wrestle a little bit if he wants to get better because like, hey, you're going into what might very well be a real fight. You might want to learn how to really defend yourself because this dude is going to hurt you, which is, again, a fascinating take on it. As bad as Ready to Rumble is, now don't get me wrong, I fully admit it's a bad movie, but I feel like it's the closest we've ever gotten to a movie that had an adequate understanding of the wrestling industry, like a reverence without... Varnish. Exactly. A reverence without a blind devotion to what the art is in the same way it had a very realistic understanding of the foibles and the faults without lampooning and making fun of it. Mm. So I just praised Ready to Rumble more than I praised The Wrestler. <laughs> Both <laughs> equally <laughs> critically acclaimed movies though, however, so totally fair. Uh. Hey, this podcast has never been anything but unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a, like one or two small things I wanted to bring up. Luke and Simon and I might find it funny that uh, one of Paige's contemporaries is named Jerry Lynn. Seriously? Yep. J-E-R-I-L-I-N-N. -N. Really? That is a nice little nod, but not one I would have expected. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. For any any of your listeners who are unaware, Jerry Lynn, with a Y, was a long-standing wrestler in the Minnesota Territory. He worked, actually, in WCW as Mr. JL very briefly. He worked in ECW under the name Jerry Lynn, where he had some phenomenal matches with Rob Van Dam. He even had a short stint in WWE in the early 2000s. I remember that briefly, yeah. Yeah. He was ECW champion, and he wrestled in TNA as their X Division champion for quite a while. Oh, yeah, no. Jerry is a very talented guy. Actually, uh, I just was on a WrestleCade with him a few months back. Uh, I think November. Still happy as a clam. He's retired now. Uh, I think he's a shipping and receiving manager mm. uh, for a warehouse. He just has like a regular day job and still teaches people how to wrestle. He's really a great guy. Nice. But yeah, that, that's that's a weird nod to have in a movie. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that. That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that was an intentional reference. Maybe. I also have written here, uh, Zach went full low key at one point. Really? Yeah. Uh, he just decides to shoot on Paige and uh, beats her up. Well, I can safely say I work with low key. I've yet to see low key go full low key. But <laughs> <laughs> he basically changes the outcome of the match in that he's supposed to lose but he basically shoots on her and acts really aggressive and then wins the bout. Which is weird but again not something unheard of in pro wrestling because unless it actually happened with Paige I don't know why it would. I don't even know why he'd be wrestling her. That's even weirder. When she goes back to Norwich her father puts her in a promotional match ah. to take advantage of her. Mm. Which I don't think would be legal considering the contract issues there. Yeah I don't think that would happen with WWE's notorious 90 days. Um... <laughs> Oh, not even just that. I've had this conversation a couple times recently uh, on the subject. I've had guys, they had entertainment lawyers, they had agents from when they worked in football stuff, and the response I've always heard about the WWE contracts run the gambit from this is borderline criminal to you're fucked if you sign this to oh my god, people seriously sign these. <laughs> 
<laughs> the contracts are notorious. Like they can run you into the ground if they want to and fire you for no reason. That's why whenever you hear someone talk about you know wrongful termination with WWE, it's laughable. They can fire you for anything. So unless they literally put something criminal as the reason they fired you, like an admission of criminal wrongdoing on their part, Yeesh. they're written like that. Yeah, they could literally fire you just because they're not required to keep you under any circumstance. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna lie, that kind of just reaffirms my desire to live on the Indies. It's a life. Let me tell you, it is definitely a unique life. No, don't get me wrong. It's not the worst thing in the world to work there. It just depends on the position you're in. But the contracts are very much for the company's benefit, not yours. Yeah. And you can make good money working there. To put in perspective, my former tag partner, Aiden English, bought a house in Chicago, which if you know anything about the American housing market, that is impressive. Yeah. But he was able to do that after working on the main roster for two years, three years. The reality of it is, is, you know, you're not paying taxes uh, out of your paycheck. So you're going to have to pay those at the end of the year. You're paying your own road expenses. That's another big chunk of your paycheck out the window. So if you're not smart, it's very easy to wind up in the hole, which some guys do. If you take care of yourself and you are smart, it's very easy to profit well from being in the company. That said, they are always going to position you as a secondary in that they can live without you, but they want to set it up to where you can't live without them. That's kind of the ideal. Mm. But that's why they're able to negotiate contracts with people and basically give them whatever they want to give them. And you kind of just have to say yes or no. And you don't really have any ground to say, well, I can go here. Okay. That, I know it's a downer. It's a downer to hear. But no, it makes sense, though, from all the stories we hear about stuff like that. I mean, the business protects the business first. And I mean, that is the business as in WWE, a company, not oh, yeah. the business of professional wrestling. Oh, exactly. To reference one of my favorite Simpsons episodes, when uh, Homer starts a uh, internet company, <laughs> HyperCompu Globonet, and eventually Bill Gates shows up stating that he cannot find what the company does, if anything, but rather than trying to risk them becoming a big deal, he's just going to buy them out. <laughs> Homer gets really excited, and he begrudgingly accepts. And then Bill Gates tells a couple guys, okay, boys, buy them out. And they start flipping stuff over and stomping things into the ground. He didn't get rich <laughs> yeah. by signing a bunch of checks. <laughs> exactly. Same thing with WWE. They didn't become a billion dollar company because, you know, they're flexible with people. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. This has been an absolute blast. There's been some really fantastic stories told here tonight. I think we've really scratched under the surface of not only the film, but also the entire industry. I think this is going to be really fantastic. Oh, yeah, totally. This was great. Okay, Luke, where can people find you? You can check me out on YouTube but the channel is called Rocked, R-O-C-K-E-D. Everything covering alternative rock, metal, the good, the great, the bad, the terrible, and the regrettable, all covered. Just check it out on YouTube, R-O-C-K-E-D. Nicely done. Rosenthorn, where can people find you? They can find me mainly on Twitter and Twitch, both at Rosen underscore Thorn with an E at the end. I have a couple projects in the work, including a collaboration with some friends of mine for a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Bridge series. So that's hopefully coming soon. And I just released my first shirt, which you can find on whatamaneuver.net. Nice. nice. And Simon, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Devious Journey, which uh, if you ever look up the word devious in a dictionary is a wonderful play on words. <laughs> Not one that anyone else appreciates, but I thought was hilarious. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram at WWE, which I can't change because Instagram is very weird about that stuff. <laughs> or you can find my, my many fine t-shirts on uh, Pro Wrestling Tees at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Simon Says, which is also a thinly veiled reference to the high quality film starring one Dennis Rodman. Nice. <laughs> that was with Dane Cook, wasn't it? Yes, and if there was one team we wanted more than Dennis Rodman and Jean-Claude Van Damme, it was Dennis Rodman and Dane Cook. Yes. Well, you know, you, you haven't watched Knock Off, the fantastic Exploding Jeans movie starring Jean-Claude Van Damme and Rob Schneider. You're assuming I have not watched every Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. <laughs> that is a dangerous gamble to make with me. Van Damme and I share a birthday. <laughs> October 18th? That is a bit of pride for me that I, I share a birthday with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Huh. He has never retweeted me when I brought that up, and I always feel sad about it. Oh, maybe this year. Maybe this will be the October. I have the least famous I've ever been. I guarantee you this ain't going to be the one. <laughs> uh. You can find me on YouTube under Film Brain. You can also find me on Facebook at Film Brain Reviews. I'm on Twitter at FB underscore BMB. On Tumblr at Film Brain BMB. And also, if you like this podcast, you can now subscribe to it on your various favorite platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and so on and so forth. So be sure to have a look for it if you aren't subscribed already. So, until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out. Thank you for listening to the Film Brain Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Just a reminder that if you want to support my work, be it podcasts or YouTube videos, please go to my Patreon at patreon.com slash filmbrain where you can experience those episodes early, among other perks. And just a quick shout out to my Patreons, Tim Poppleton, SoFox, Inigo Almandos, Tim Tark, G Viral, Robert Murray, Henry Jacob, Manuel Jonan, Lassie Voigt, Marley Berrickmans, Joshua Bowden. And remember, if you have any feedback about the show over social media, please use the hashtag FilmBrainPodcast.